Hello, and welcome to the Why We Argue podcast. I'm Robert Talese. I host the program. I'm professor of philosophy at Vanderbilt University. Why We Argue is produced by Humility and Conviction in Public Life, a project based at the University of Connecticut, which explores how to balance our deepest commitments with open-mindedness, a respect for reason, and intellectual humility. The series, which is made possible by generous funding from the John Templeton Foundation, features brief discussions with publicly-minded thinkers about the state of civil discourse in contemporary democracy. Today, my guest is William Galston. Bill is Ezra K. Zilka Chair and Senior Fellow in the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies Program. Bill is a former policy advisor to President Clinton, and he writes a weekly column for the Wall Street Journal. In addition, though, Bill is an accomplished political philosopher who's written influentially about value conflict and citizenship in contemporary democracy. Good morning, Bill. Hi, Bob. How are you doing today? Better than the country. (laughs) Well, let's jump into it then, uh, Bill. Um, So uh, the United States uh, has a new president, as we're all aware, and the country uh, seems, at least to me, Uh, uncommonly polarized. There are regular mass protests against the president's policies and his stated plans. And these protests, it seems to me, largely embolden um, uh, the president and some of his supporters. Um, Maybe it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that politically, um, citizens are divided in a way so that um, it's not even clear whether they actually disagree Rather, it seems that they might be divided to the extent that they occupy distinct political worlds, uh, each with its own facts, with its own sources of information, with its own conceptions of events, uh, its own statistics and experts and so on. Um, Arguably, we saw this on a somewhat lesser scale during the election, it seems to me at least. Um, But one wonders if, if if the citizens are divided in that... Um, almost uh, absolute way, Um, what could citizenship be? What do you make of this? (laughs) Well, we're in a fix. There's no question about it. And it's taken us a long time to get to where we are. This isn't a phenomenon of the past 18 months or two years. Uh, The polarization of the American political scene and party system has been increasing really for 15 or even 20 years and the you can see this if you just look at a chart with the ideological positioning of the members of the major parties in congress uh, if you looked at them at the beginning of the 1990s or even the middle of the 1990s, there was a very substantial amount of overlap between those two bell curves. And since then, they've moved farther and farther apart. Uh, A couple of years ago, we reached a point where the most conservative Democrat in the Senate was more liberal than the most liberal Republican in the Senate. Uh, There was quite literally no overlap between the two parties, not even a point of tangency. And this is a situation that we haven't seen for more than a century, really, since the 1890s, the political scientists tell us. Uh, Many of us grew up with a party system Mm -hmm. where there were obviously differences between the major parties, but you also had substantial numbers of dissenting voices in both parties. And so you had conservative Democrats in the South, liberal Republicans in the Northeast, uh, and lots of dialogue across party lines. These were not separate and alien tribes, which is what they've become now. Uh, Added to this ideological drift is the intensification of uh, what might be called epistemological closure, where, as you say, the adherents of the two parties tend to listen to different radio stations, they read different newspapers, they watch different television shows, they consume on social media. the websites and podcasts that they regard as most congenial to their existing worldview. They believe what reinforces that worldview and they reject 
what contradicts it. So what does citizenship mean in these circumstances? Uh, it means for people who have a more old-fashioned and more capacious conception of citizenship, a constant struggle against the tide of tribalism. Right. And later on, perhaps we can talk more concretely about the forms that that struggle might take. But it's what is now required by our circumstances. Let me just add one other point. Sure. It's easy to talk about alternative facts when you're in the realm of words. But when we actually start talking about concrete experiences, then uh, there tends to be more common ground and more epistemological openness. Uh, let me give you an example or a few examples. Great. Uh, the, the new president of the United States has promised to restore manufacturing jobs in this country. And in three or four years, the American people will be able to see for themselves whether or not that has happened. Uh, the new president in line with his party uh, has promised to repeal the Affordable Care Act, aka Obamacare, and replace it with something better. Uh, I have no doubt that there will be major legislation in that area and the American people will be able to judge for themselves through their personal experiences. Are they better off or worse off as the result of this change? Uh, there's a famous episode in a Marx Brothers picture <laughs> where I think it's Chico who gets you know caught in bed with a jealous husband's wife uh, and Chico sits up in bed and denies the accusations uh, and the jealous husband gets irate for obvious reasons and finally yells, well, how can you deny it? I'm looking right at you. You know, to which Chico replies famously, well, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? <laughs> now, my thesis of citizenship is that eventually the American people will believe the evidence of their own senses and that that is – that is the saving grace, experience rather than slippery words. Um, that's wonderful um, and, and, and a, 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 a point um, of optimism. But um, let me um, suggest a, a bit of pushback. Would that be OK? Um, More than OK. Oh, great. Um, so I think you're right that um, uh, – Experience, um, you know, the proof will be in the pudding, and the pudding is 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 our experience. We'll, we'll see whether um, uh, the manufacturing jobs come back. We'll see what the situation might be with uh, healthcare in the country. Um, but um, those experiences are always um, understood um, by means of um, political talk. It seems to me. And so um, you're right that in the Marx Brothers uh, uh, um, picture, um, there's something ridiculous about you know who you're going to believe, but um, maybe it's um, uh, maybe it's easier in the political realm to um, to shift blame and to um, if things don't go well uh, for uh, the president for the president to put. Um, uh, responsibility for things that have happened or haven't happened uh, on other um, on other people, um, including as he has done in uh, in the past, some people in his own party. So I wonder if there isn't a a, a region within our political uh, experience where um, the distinction between uh, lived experience and the descriptions uh, and the stories we tell about those experiences aren't a little bit harder to tease apart than they might be in the, in the Marx Brothers example. <laughs> well, uh, this, as you know, is a view with you know, a great deal of history behind it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, was a, you know, it, was a fear, uh, it was a fear articulated uh, by Greek philosophers, <laughs> uh, by Greek playwrights such as Aristophanes. Uh, it's why 
Aristotle chose to devote an entire book to the subject of rhetoric. Right. Uh, it was the theme of one of Plato's greatest dialogues, the Gorgias, mm -hmm. you know, which I reread every year just to keep my head straight in your That's a good capital. plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but my, you know, my experience-based view is that citizens accept accusations and explanations for failure for only so long. Okay. That for the better part of a century now, uh, the president of the United States has been held responsible uh, for the progress of the economy or lack of progress uh, and for the sponsorship and implementation of major legislation and for the effects of that legislation. And no doubt there are ways of, of deflecting the evidence for a while. But ultimately, and I guess this is my small d democratic credo or faith, ultimately the people will judge for themselves based on the categories of their own direct experience. Now, there's some issues that cannot be judged in that way. Right. If you're talking about a foreign policy issue uh, that is remote from the lives and the experiences of most people, then there's no question about the fact that words matter. But even there, if people start coming back from wars with injuries, with psychological damage, with stories of stupidity uh, in the management of the war, with stories of fuzziness about the goals of a war, etc., that begins to have an effect. Mm -hmm. So the distant becomes visible and immediate and helps to shape public perceptions. That's certainly what's happened with a series of wars that this country has been in since I was in college. Right. So I am more I am more confident in the long term consequences and political effects of political reality than some other people are. I do not subscribe to the proposition that political rhetoric can uh, overcome uh, the force of experience. Excellent. Um let me return to um, – I thought you made a nice distinction uh, at the very beginning between um, sort of deeply disagreeing uh, um, uh, representatives and citizens um, where d deep disagreement uh, is very serious disagreement but it still allows the possibility of overlap and then what you described as sort of tribal divisions – which look like they're uh, even more severe uh, separations that seem to not permit overlap because the, the nature of the divide is not, um, uh, um, you know, seems to be at the level uh, not of what to make of some commonly perceived or acknowledged uh, fact or datum, but um, a disagreement over w w what sorts of things are facts and what sorts of things are data. Um, the epistemic closure uh, point, which w was one of the hallmarks that you cited about this sort of tribal divisions, um, it seems clear – and this, this is a point that uh, um, um, lots of people have made, especially Cass Sunstein. Um, it seems that um, the technology is driving uh, – well, that's going to be the question actually. Is the technology <laughs> driving the tribalism and the epistemic closure or is the technology being used in the ways that it's being used because um, the tribalism already exists? People are already disposed to – listen only to louder echoes of their own voices and to attend only to the kinds of news sources that reaffirm their, um, their antecedent uh, beliefs, uh, attitudes and, and, and perceptions? Or is the technology playing um, a causal role in the other direction? Is it, is it causing the tribalism and the, the epistemological closure? Do you have a view about that? I have a view that it's a vicious cycle. Ah, good. Uh, like so many other social processes – you know, uh, 
causes and consequences are frequently linked in both directions. And I think that's what's going on here. It's not all of one or all of, all of the other. That said, there's also a hunger in the land for what are seen as more neutral sources that people think they can believe in. Let me give you an example. Uh, I spend a fair amount of time listening to C-SPAN. It's possible there, uh, there, there is a radio broadcast of C-SPAN mm -hmm. as well as the various television programs. And so many people phone in and they begin their statements or their questions with, thank you for C-SPAN. Yeah. And the reason they thank C-SPAN is that they can, they can turn it on and see an unmediated picture, an uncommented picture of Congress in action, of politicians speaking at rallies, of panel discussions, et cetera, et cetera. And it's clear to me, uh, and survey research backs this up, uh, that a substantial percentage of the American people would prefer to see their political life not through the prism of somebody else's selection of experience and comment on it, but rather for themselves. That is to make the distant an immediate experience in the same way that what is close to home is already an immediate experience. And I think that's, that's worth noting and building on. Uh, and it suggests to me that there may well be a future for forms of media that come to be perceived as more like C-SPAN and less like talk radio. Right. So um, I'm curious about, uh, about some, of the, um, some of the data uh, about what, what people prefer. So one of the things that seems um, puzzling, at least to me, is how um, mainstream televised news programming – is now almost entirely um, formatted uh, in a way that um, on the one hand, one would think would make deliberative Democrats very happy because the newscaster says that a story – something has happened and then um, instantly there's a panel discussion of two or three people and um, – uh, in between uh, the, the newscaster saying that some event has occurred uh, and the next commercial, there's a back and forth. So it looks as if um, at least mainstream televised news has a, uh, an element that recognizes the importance of conversation and exchanging perspectives and all the rest. However, <laughs> um, maybe because of the constraints of the actual format and the, the, the need to get the commercial advertising time in, um, it seems also democratically disastrous. Does that seem right to you? In that the panel discussion sort of fuzzes up what actually happened? Uh, in other F words, I'm trying to yeah. – I'm trying to get your question. Sure. In that it's, it's, it's hard after the panel discussion. You don't emerge with a clearer view of, of what's happened. But also um, uh, it looks like the, the way the news is reported has just become another occasion for a kind of political gamesmanship where people look like they're exchanging perspectives and reasons and considerations when really um, what's being presented is a kind of spectacle for the consumer to pick a side uh, among um, some talking heads. Well, if the conversation goes on for any length of time, the talking heads will offer various facts or alleged facts and arguments or alleged arguments in favor of his or her position. So in principle, it, it lends itself to more than simply taking a side. Now, one of the things that I frequently come out with when I listen to programs like that in areas where I'm not deeply knowledgeable, uh, I, I come away with more confusion than I entered with. That's not always a bad thing. Right. Uh, and uh, – it's also the case that 
you can learn something about the elements of your own thinking. And I've, I've thought a lot about the process of deliberation uh, because it seems to me that it involves three things in practical life. Number one, uh, a discussion on the level of principle. Number two, the ascertainment of facts insofar as that's a feasible task. But number three, what really introduces the note of indeterminacy is predictions about the outcomes of different courses of action. Right. And that's where in, in many cases the debate becomes genuinely confusing. Let me give you an example. Uh, during the debate over welfare reform in the middle of the 1990s, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who had been seized of the question of welfare longer than just about anybody in the Senate, who devoted more intellectual energy and attention to it, who would looked at the research more than anybody else had, uh, confidently predicted that if the welfare reform bill passed, that millions of children and, parent and their parents would be sleeping on heating grates. Mm. That didn't happen. If Moynihan had been right about that, it would have been a compelling argument against enacting right. welfare reform in anything like the form that it was presented to the Senate. But it didn't happen. Now, Frequently, people have to make decisions whether elected officials or ordinary citizens based not just on principles and facts but about their expectations, the future consequences of current actions. And those expectations are colored by pictures of the way the world works. And frequently, you can't know until after the fact whether a particular view of the world has turned out to be more accurate or not. So, so deliberation, it seems to me, is inherently underdetermined by what we can know with certainty or a reasonably high probability. Right. Um, but I guess sometimes um, uh, the audiences to um, uh, to news programming that looks like it's aimed at um, uh, presenting um, – uh, uh, at least the, uh, portraying uh, a, a mini deliberation among panelists on a CNN uh, news program. Um, I, I wonder if it doesn't more often serve to just um, uh, not alert people to the complexities of pressing political issues and the difficulty of uh, trying to um, uh, uh, you know. Discern what the most plausible way of, uh, of of predicting the outcomes of particular policy proposals. But I wonder if it doesn't just um, give viewers the the opportunity to um, to become more entrenched in the thing that they were antecedently inclined to think. But it uh, it may well. Yeah. Uh, but that but that raises the question of what those issue segments are designed to do. Right. Uh, and let me, give you, let me give you an analogy. Suppose you think of the viewing public as a jury and the talking heads as lawyers or advocates offering different briefs. They're not trying to come to agreement. They're not deliberating in that sense. Right. They are appealing to the civic jury, which is a different kind of process. Uh, and if the, if the networks wanted to, to model genuine deliberation, they would have to organize themselves completely differently. Right. Now, it wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a bad idea if we saw more of that, but uh, – but modeling real deliberation is much slower, less dramatic, less newsworthy, less watchable. Uh, and it's worth asking the question and perhaps experience can determine the answer to this question. If 
If major networks wanted to devote an hour a week to a serious, sustained, deliberative conversation on an important public policy issue, what kind of audience would that get, I wonder? It's not a skeptical question. Uh, It's a genuine expression of ignorance and doubt. Right. So – and – most ordinary citizens are very busy with their own lives. There's a reason why networks present things in short bursts because right. they are skeptical that people have the time or frankly the attention span to stick with it any longer than that. Right. Um, Bill, you've been very generous with your time. Um, as a as sort of a last question for, uh, for, for, for wrapping up the conversation, um, are there any lessons that you can think of that we should take away, particularly of um, how things have gone with, uh, with the election and, and since? Is there any, any advice you would like to give to uh, the American citizenry? Uh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> indeed. And I hope it's practical advice. The advice is this. There is no invisible civic hand whose operation will automatically tend toward the production of civic health. If we want a different kind of civic life, we're going to have to work for it and work for it quite intentionally. Let me give you an example. Some years ago, I helped form a new organization here in Washington called No Labels. And the point of the organization is to bring people together across party lines for serious conversations about and even deliberations concerning important public policy issues and not just at the level of grassroots citizens but also among elected officials. And so now at the beginning of the new administration, we have an actual caucus in the Congress of the United States of about 40 members evenly divided between Democratic representatives and Republican representatives. And they have taken major steps towards making common cause, acting as one despite their partisan differences on issues such as tax reform uh, and infrastructure investment. And they've sent a public letter to the leaders of the political parties and to the president announcing their presence and their modus operandi and their intentions. Now, obviously, time will tell whether this kind of cooperation across party lines is sturdy enough to survive the pressures of partisanship from the White House, from congressional leaders, et cetera. But it's worth a try. We're only going to change the direction of our politics if we lean against the tide of our politics. It will not happen by itself. And so this is truly a time for all citizens to come to the aid of their country and certainly to the aid of the kind of political system that I am confident we still want despite the vicissitudes of the moment. Bill, that was uh, a wonderful uh, and and very um, uh, appropriately optimistic, not uh, inappropriately optimistic, uh, place to end the conversation. Thanks uh, for talking to us today on the Why We Argue podcast. It's been my great pleasure, Bob. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in to the Why We Argue podcast, which I remind you is produced by the University of Connecticut's Humility and Conviction in Public Life Project with generous support from the John Templeton Foundation. You can follow the project on Twitter and on Facebook at at Public Humility. That's one word, Public Humility. Thank you so much, and bye for now.